he's also one of the smartest people that I know, and he's an amazing doctor. So I'm going to ring him on the horn right now, and hopefully he's going to tell us how to not die from uh, COVID-19. There you go. Yes, we got oh, you. Here we, we go. hear you loud and clear, Doc. All right, Anthem. How you doing? So far, so good. Just trying to stay alive. I was hoping you could help us do that. We're doing our best. Are you still Are you still practicing, or are you uh, social distancing yourself? So what we're doing is we're still seeing people. We're not seeing anybody who's sick, has a fever, has any kind of cough, shortness of breath to minimize everyone's exposure because we don't want sick people coming into the medical buildings because we're in a building with, you know, a lot of patients who are immune suppressed. We want to minimize everyone's exposure and we're trying to limit any other activity that would expose anybody. So the majority of what we're doing is virtual consults and then seeing how we are. But isn't part of the danger of this disease is the, is the two week, it's like almost silent, quiet inc incubation period. Like how, how do you know that even though they may not be exhibiting symptoms that they have it? Well, here's the issue is that they've done studies as far back as two, three months ago in China. And they were seeing that people who were exposed didn't necessarily even know they were exposed before they were symptomatic, there's an average, it's, it's what's called an asymptotic curve. So the first few days, very few people. Between day five and day 10, a lot of people. Mm. And after day 10 or 11, very few people actually convert to positive. So that first four or five days before anyone's really that symptomatic, what they're finding is that there are about one in 20 people who aren't really symptomatic, who don't know they've been exposed, who are potentially contagious got it so about one in 20 are contagious without realizing it until they suddenly hit that fifth day and suddenly they have fever chills shortness of breath mm. the terrible body aches what we've seen a lot of are people who come in and they can't smell or taste all of a sudden and they've always had a great sense of smell or taste and the issue is suddenly wait we see this like unexplained once or twice a year and i see this about a hundred times a year because i'm an expert in smell and taste yeah and in the last two months i've seen 20 cases of it i've spoken to my colleagues i've looked at the literature from france germany england iran and china and one in five people has coronavirus they manifest because they can't smell or taste suddenly they can't smell what they're cooking they can't smell natural gas wow they can't smell Real, they can't smell a diaper, which is it's a it's a big symptom to know about because if you have that and a terrible headache and infection right now, there's a very good chance you've got the coronavirus. Wow. Okay, I have a headache, but it's because I flipped a uh, flipped a doom buggy this morning. <laughs> so <laughs> that's probably actually irrelevant. I'll ask you the next question, Doc. Uh, what are some long term uh, repercussions of this virus? Well, I hate to say it, but it's going to be another 12 or 18 months of this process. Oh, what? We're, seeing, we're just coming out of winter and we're just coming out of the surge. So our curve, if you've seen any of the CDC projections for it, where they're like, if everyone just goes out, does their normal thing, we're going to see this many spikes and then it's going to come down quickly. We're flattening the curve because the problem is the higher the peak, the fewer people are able to see you in the emergency room, keep you in the hospital because we're running out of hospital beds within the next four weeks, running out of intensive care units. And then in intensive care units, we're running out of ventilators and respirators. And then any of the provisional medicines we have, they're also in short supply because of supply chain issues in terms of limited availability all up front. You want to see that if we can flatten that curve, we can hopefully get the best treatment of, to the most number of people. I wanted to ask how effective the masks are, because I read somewhere that the CDC right. is uh, advising all Americans to wear masks. Are they actually doing anything, or is it just a look yeah. like Burning Man? Absolutely. I mean, look, if you go into a room and there are 10 people in that room, and let's say a 10 by 20 room, one person coughs. If you cough or sneeze, like you just yawn, mm -hmm. you generate respiratory droplets, which are sneeze, cough, and those come out of you at 30 to 50 miles an hour. Ooh. So most of those particles, if you're talking to somebody and they have food in their mouth and they're speaking, like those particles will mostly dissipate within 
one to three feet, but then now about five or six feet, 90, 95% of those particles are gone. But you also have aerosols. So when you cough, those very small, fine particles that come out, hmm. they can go five to 50 feet reliably and be in the air, kind of hang in the air, especially when it's colder for up to three hours, according to the CDC. Oh my God. So if you're wearing a mask and you sneeze, right? You wear any kind of homemade mask made out of cotton, made out of like kitchen towel that's clean, made out of t-shirt material. Yep. You're going to catch the vast majority of it basically better than holding your hand in front of your mouth. I got a, I got a personal question. Yes, sir. Are you prepared for doomsday? This in our eyes is doomsday. In the next two weeks in California, we're going to hit that very high surge and peak that we're expecting. And everybody has to do their part. The most important part for your folks, and thank you for talking to me because we're going to get through this. Most of, our, most of us are going to get through this, but we're going to say, what, what, what else could we have done? What could we have done better to protect the person to my left, the person to my right, my parents, my grandparents, my friend who's recovering from cancer chemotherapy. Mm. So number one, please stay at home. Stay at home, stay at home. It makes a huge difference. Hey doc, what's the, uh, what's the recovery like for the people that have beaten coronavirus? So it's interesting. I've had people where for three weeks, they're dragging on the ground and they're really sick and exhausted, having a hard time breathing, like feeling like an elephant on their chest. Mm -hmm. And I've had people where they just had terrible bus muscle and body aches for a day or two, lost their sense of smell for like five or 10 days, and then pretty much have been back to normal because there's a wide variation in how people are manifesting this virus. Whether it was weaponized by nature or whoever, this is a virus that's a lot more efficient. And again, the attack rate, given the exposure, it's not like the flu where if you have two people in a household, one person has the flu, the next person next to them, their spouse, their child, has about a 20% chance or a one out of five chance of getting the flu. With this, we're seeing if there are five people in a household, three or four of them are getting this mm -hmm. coronavirus Whoa. from more than a casual exposure. And a casual exposure is I'm six feet away for 15 or 20 minutes and that's it. Mm -hmm. It's not like I'm sitting in an exam room across from someone three feet apart, again, without a mask, which at this point would be foolish, yeah. and getting them to cough in my face. That's a real exposure at home because anyone who has kids knows when your kids are sick, they're stuck to you. They're sneezing on you. They're snotting on your leg. There's going to be stuff on your clothes because that's what parenting is. Hmm. Same in that this virus is far higher in terms of its successful attack rate. What's the end game here, Doc? Like, are we, is it, will there be some sort of vaccine, hopefully? Or like, how do we really truly get out of this so we can continue living our normal lives? So, so the good news is there are several treatments that show a lot of promise. Number one, we have Zithromax and hydroxychloroquine. If you're in the hospital being monitored for liver function, then you can have that and it should improve your chances. There have been three good studies, a lot more coming to show whether or not it actually does any help. Okay. We have remdesivir, a really good antiviral that was used for Ebola that's in trials right now. And trials mean we have really sick people, we're putting them on it and we're trying to see Group A that got it, Group B that didn't get it for whatever reason, who is actually doing better? Because mm. these are all medicines with significant side effects. We have Coletra, which is one of the AIDS drugs that's two different antiretrovirals because the virus doesn't have its own DNA. It's an RNA virus. It has to use cellular infrastructure to use. So it uses your own cell's machinery. Once it enters the cell, hi hijacks it to produce itself. We can modify it there. We can modify those hormone mediators called interleukins, which are hormones in your immune system that tell other cells, white blood cells need help and they want to attack and kill. Mm. And those are what go crazy when someone's lungs fill up with fluid or they get a lot of inflammation. And then ultimately the plan is the vaccine, which again, unless there's been a lot of mutation in the virus, you're going to see a huge dip in virus numbers in 12 to 18 months when we get the vaccine. But remember, with all respiratory cold viruses and coronaviruses, about one in every cold, one in every eight colds in America every year. So if you're seeing that, we're seeing this huge spike of several million people 
who are getting infected. And in countries like England, where they didn't socially isolate or distance nearly as quickly, hmm. the epidemiologists are expecting that out of every 10 people, eight of them will be infected within the next three months. Wow. Oh my so God. you haven't seen too much mutation. The vaccine, which will come out already being tested, will be out in the next 12 to 18 months because they don't just test it. They have to scale it up and produce 100 million doses for the wow. United States alone. Wow. Oh, my God. To see that it's safe. So it's about 12 <laughs> to 18 months out.